in introductions for, for a little bit later, but I definitely want to thank our community panelists who will be adding uh, a lot to the discussion today. Um, and lastly, today's a very special day. Today is the 50th anniversary of the assassination of, Do of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. And um, I know that Dr. David Jones is going to open up his speech or, or his presentation with um, some work of Dr. Martin Luther King, but, but he gave a very um, historical and riveting speech the evening right before he was murdered uh, that actually talked very specifically about the First Amendment. And I just wanted us to, um, in whatever way you want to um, either be silent um, or however it is that you want to remember in remembrance of this person who is no longer with us, um, who has such historical contributions to make to this country, um, just hear his words as I'm gonna speak now. Now about injunctions. We have an injunction and we're going into court tomorrow morning to fight this illegal, unconstitutional injunction. All we say in Amer to America is to be true to what you said on paper. If I lived in China, or even in Russia, or any totalitarian country, maybe I could understand some of these illegal injunctions. Maybe I could understand the denial of certain basic First Amendment privileges, because they haven't committed themselves to that over there. But somewhere I read of the freedom of assembly. Somewhere I read the freedom of speech. Somewhere I read of the freedom of the press. Somewhere I read that the greatness of America is the right to protest for right. And so just as I say, we aren't gonna let any dogs or water hoses turn us around, we aren't gonna let any injunction turn us around. I will leave you with those words. And I'd like to introduce uh, Antoinette Gomes, the Director of the Community Center for the Rest of the Program. Thank you very much. Good afternoon again, everybody. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here on behalf of the DOD to welcome you to the, their 2018 spring uh, lecture, uh, Free Speech on Campus, Multiple Perspectives. Uh, as Anna just introduced me, I'm Antoinette Combs. I'm director of the Unity Center here, um, and thereby a standing member of the Dialogue on Diversity Committee. So thank you very much, Anna, for your remarks. Um, I'd like to just acknowledge our audience uh, right now. Uh, so there are some members of the Dialogue on Diversity Committee uh, in the room with me, and so if you could wave or stand or however you're comfortable so that we can see who you are and recognize you. Thank you. And there are also some members of the faculty here, if you could do likewise, just so that we see who you are in the room. Thank you. Um, the Committee on College Lectures, uh, I, I would like to really extend my gratitude for their support, not only of this year's spring lecture, but of past spring lectures, uh, they are also very supportive. They're always very supportive of the work of the Dialogue on Diversity. Um, and then, most importantly, I'd like to acknowledge and recognize and, 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 and show some gratitude for the students in the room uh, because this spring lecture really is formed with you in mind. So I, I, you can raise your hands and, or wave if you want to, but I know that that's the majority of you in the room today, so thank you for being here. So a few words about the Dialogue on Diversity before we uh, get started. Um, it was established on this campus more than 20 years ago uh, to recognize the evolving nature of diversity and inclusion uh, within the campus community. So the committee is comprised of faculty, staff, and students that are interested in exploring some of the more challenging, uh, sometimes uh, divisive issues affecting our society and college universities. And um, so the committee is also invested in the concept of inclusive excellence. And if you've read the college's strategic plan, then you've read those words um, because inclusive excellence is one of the pillars that informs our strategic plan. And today, our campus is more diverse than it has ever been. That's a good thing because research shows us that 
diverse perspectives enhance innovation and critical analysis and creativity, all things that are supposed to be emerging and being honed on college and university campuses. So if we use the Association of American Colleges and Universities definition, inclusive excellence is an active process through which colleges and universities achieve excellence in learning, teaching, student development, institutional functioning, and engagement in local and global communities. So um, I'd like to encourage you uh, to give these speakers your attention, but likewise would like to encourage you to please engage in some dialogue with us when they are finished. There is food and drink in the back of the room. Feel free to partake uh, at any time. Please feel free to just get up and help yourself. Uh, I'd like to, at this time, um, introduce a couple of other people in the room because they're going to be co-facilitating uh, with me today. And they are a graduate student in the School of Social Work here, Brianna Winstead. And also uh, Harrison Grigsby, who is an educational support facilitator with the Learning for Life program here. And so now I have the honor of introducing a couple of uh, folks to you. The program is going to start uh, with a presentation from the ACLU, and um, we are uh, happy to be able to welcome two representatives from the Rhode Island chapter. Uh, one is an ACLU attorney. His name is John Deneen. John, if you could wave to us. And then um, uh, Stephen Brown, who is the executive director of the Rhode Island affiliate of the American Civil Liberties Union and has served in that capacity for um, two and a half decades now. Um, and and, and has, uh, he came to us from the Iowa Civil uh, Liberties Union. Um, and he's also worked uh, in, in, with the ACLU in Philadelphia as well. Uh, and then secondly, you will hear from Dr. David Jones, uh, who is a leading student care scholar practitioner, uh, previously recognized by the National Association for Student Personnel Administrators, or NASPA, uh, with the Doris Ching Award for Excellence as a, a student affairs professional. And Dr. Jones is currently the director of the Paul Robeson Cultural Center at Rutgers University, uh, New Brunswick, and a diversity consultant, trainer, and speaker for universities, corporations, and community organizations. So, can we please welcome our first presenters from the ACLU? Uh, thank you very much, Antoinette, uh, Anna, everybody who helped organize this event, uh, and all of you who, who came to listen to it. Um, I really appreciate how Anna started this by quoting uh, Martin Luther King Jr., especially on this, on this uh, really somber anniversary. Um, as you heard from those excerpts, uh, Martin Luther King was very familiar um, with the importance of freedom of speech. Uh, and in fact, some of the most critical First Amendment cases um, that exist came out of the civil rights movement. And I think that's important to understand and remember because sometimes people try to make a dichotomy, and I think it's a false dichotomy between promoting equality and promoting freedom of speech. Um, they are not in conflict with each other. I would argue that one is necessary for the other. Um, you cannot have equality, you cannot fight for equality um, without having the right to freedom of speech. Um, and the cases that came out of the civil rights movement demonstrate that probably better than anything else because you know, some of the, some of the uh, cases had it when Martin Luther King and others uh, tried to march in Selma, Alabama. Um, the residents, the police, all tried to stop them. You heard about these injunctions that um, municipalities kept on trying to get to stop Martin Luther King and others from marching, protesting, leafleting uh, in support of civil rights. And for the most part, uh, the courts ended up supporting um, the group, the civil rights movement's ability to do that. And what many people don't understand, though, is that one of the key cases that courts relied on to say that Martin Luther King and others had the right to go into these very hostile communities, even though all the residents there didn't want him to march, um, threatened violence um, if they marched, 
Um, they were relying on a 1949 U.S. Supreme Court case involving a, de a defrock priest named Arthur Tomaniello. And he spoke in a packed auditorium one night in Chicago and gave a really vitriolic, racist, anti-Semitic speech. And while he was speaking, a very large crowd gathered outside the auditorium um, and themselves started creating disturbances uh, while they were trying to stop Terminiello from speaking. Uh, as a result of the disturbance that occurred outside the auditorium, the speaker, Terminiello, um, was charged with violating um, city laws banning disturbances during speeches, um, even though he himself had not been responsible for it. Um, but because he was the genesis of all this disturbance, um, he was arrested. Um, his case went all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. And in a, what is a critical decision in 1949, the Supreme Court um, sided with Terminiello, this, this fascist and, and anti-Semite, and said the First Amendment guarantees the right of people to be provocative um, as long as they themselves don't engage in violence, don't incite others to violence. It simply is not appropriate or fair under the First Amendment to hold people responsible, to bar them from speaking because of what people who are listening to it might do. Um, that's not the speaker's fault, it's the people who are actually engaged uh, in violence that must be held responsible. Now that was a very controversial decision at the time, but it was a decision like that that was cited over and over and over to give Martin Luther King the same right to be able to go into communities like Selma, even though nobody wanted him there, even though they threatened to engage in violence, and the response of the judiciary was, well, then, if you engage in violence, you're going to be arrested. You can't stop somebody from speaking. Uh, and one of the, I find, one of the hardest things for a lot of people to understand is just how critical this notion of the indivisibility of free speech is. You can't have it for yourself if you're not willing to give it for others. Uh, and I think it's particularly important in the civil rights uh, context because when you're fighting for civil rights, uh, whether it's in the 60s or now, in terms of the rights of racial minorities, um, whether it's the rights of the LGBT community, um, all too often you're talking about rights for people who are themselves in the minority. Um, if they were in, in positions of power, they probably wouldn't have to worry about protecting their rights because they'd be protected for them automatically. So if you want to ensure that you're going to have the ability to engage in speech, to promote your views, to promote a movement, um, you have to take the good with the bad. You have to understand that there may be people you hate to hear who are going to have the same right you are. Um, the one other point I will make, because I do want a lot of time for, for dialogue, um, is uh, in attempting to su suppress speech, which is, you know, it's, it's almost a com a, a, an instinctual urge, I find. Um, you know, you just don't want to hear people say terrible things, understandably, and the response, instead of saying, well, we're going to counter that with more speeches to try to, try to stop them from speaking, and, that, and that's the wrong approach. And it's wrong not just as a matter of principle, but I encourage you to think of it as being wrong as a matter of practicality as well, because when you suppress these individuals, the speeches of individuals you don't like, they come out as martyrs uh, and talk about how they aren't allowed to express their views. And perhaps more importantly, what you do is you give them more attention um, than they would otherwise get. And it's, and it's often the role of provocateurs to do that. They really don't care if they get, end up speaking. They want you to, to stop them from speaking um, because they get their message out even better that way. And um, well, when I talk about this, I'm always reminded of um, a great quote from Mark Twain. Um, you may or may not know this, but shortly after The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn was published, there was a library that attempted to ban it, just as it's now been, there have been attempts to ban it uh, throughout the century. Um, and when Mark Twain heard the news that his book had been censored, he didn't complain. He said, that's the best news I ever heard. That's going to sell us at least 20,000 20, more copies. And that's what happens with censorship. You, you have this forbidden fruit, 
and it simply makes people more interested, more curious. Why is it that you don't want us to hear what's being said or what's being written? Um, so as debates come up, as, as, as critical um, issues arise, whether it's on, the, on this campus or in the broader community, I hope you will keep in mind the importance of this notion of indivisibility for freedom of speech um, and the idea of countering bad speech with speech of your own to make sure that in the long run, you'll be able to continue to speak out on issues that are of importance to you. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to John Neal. exactly where I was, the moment that I heard that Martin Luther King had been assassinated, 50 years ago to this day. I remember that moment exactly, and it's a sad thing to say. In honor of this uh, diversity lecture series, I do have one thing to say also about Martin Luther King. First of all, I'm aware that the three outside speakers are all male. And that's an issue in itself that maybe we can talk about later on during the discussion period. But I, I've noticed that we're all, we're all of the same gender, which is not a good thing. But I'm one of the, I want to make a confession today, too. I'm one of those white people who remembers Martin Luther King before 68. And I remember thinking he was pretty good on civil rights, but he shouldn't wade into foreign affairs. Because one of the things that Martin Luther King did at Riverside Cathedral in New York City was give a speech in which he linked the civil rights movement with the general approach that America was taking around the world. And he criticized the Vietnam War. And I, remember, I was one of those white people that thought, uh-oh, this guy's going off the deep end. He should have minded his own business and stayed with what he knew well. And it took me a few couple of years to realize, no, he's right. He's right about this. Because I was, I was hesitant to go along with him at first, as a white person. I thought he was good when he stayed in his own backyard on civil rights, but he should not have ventured into foreign affairs. And that was my belief at the time, for a couple of years. And it was not until 68, around the time he died, that I had finally realized that he was correct, and a lot of other people were correct, that the civil rights movement was linked to foreign affairs as well. Everything was linked to everything else, unfortunately, for me. Because uh, that was also the beginning of the realization that there were a lot of women and minorities coming along who were active in the movement who didn't want white guys like me telling them what to do anymore. Didn't need us. And that was hard to take for a lot of people. So I, I do remember a lot from the, from the 60s. And I'll talk about that again when we talk about the First Amendment. I want to emphasize a couple of things about the First Amendment. One is that the important thing that you, you should realize as students at a publicly funded government institution is that the, the First Amendment applies to you. The First Amendment, like, like all of the Bill of Rights, is really a prohibition on government, federal government. It took many years before it even applied to state governments. But it's a prohibition on government, action. A lot of people think, oh, I have First Amendment rights. And unfortunately, for students at other schools, not, not this school, but other schools, which are private, I have to tell them that, no, you don't have First Amendment rights. Because the, the government isn't doing anything in this case at all. And that's, that's difficult for them to accept. Now, there may well be other issues that we can latch onto at other schools such as the tradition of free speech and academic freedom, handbooks, contracts, all kinds of things that are good for students and for free speech rights. But you can't just blithely say that the First Amendment applies everywhere across the board. It only applies as a prohibition on government action. And that's important to realize. That, and the other thing that's important to realize is that nothing and this has been a hard lesson for me to learn recently, in this past year, 
Nothing is guaranteed. The lessons that I thought we learned many years ago was solidly entrenched in our legal system have come, on, have come into question now. And I, I thought, gee, I thought that was settled, and it's not settled. It's up for grabs again. An example being, I thought it was settled law when I went to law school a long time ago that you couldn't discriminate against somebody based on religion just because you wanted to sell a, a wedding cake only to certain kinds of people. That, you, that if it was your personal belief to be opposed to another group of people, you could not be at what's called a public accommodation and have a, a, a store or a hotel or a motel or a business that, that was open to the public. I thought that was settled law, but that's now created a, a, not an issue of controversy as if that's an up for grabs again. So it's taught me that nothing is settled in this society that we have. Nothing is settled. And things that I thought were, were clear are no longer clear, apparently. <coughs> For many years, I've heard that, uh, the, the saying that the, the price of liberty is eternal vigilance, that there's no victory that's permanent. And I used to think, well, that's interesting, but some victories must be permanent, right? Well, guess what? That's correct. There are no victories that are permanent. And everything is up for grabs again in this country, <coughs> including the First Amendment. Because most people on this planet do not have a First Amendment at all. They do not have any free speech rights at all. <coughs> so if you go to a lot of other countries, including England, for example, and assert your First Amendment rights, people will look at you like you're from another planet. <coughs> so keep that in mind as well. Now, the First Amendment is, is um, often misunderstood because it's, it's the kind of thing, as an ACLU lawyer, <coughs> I'm, I'm intrigued by people over the years who, who like to say, oh, I, I think the ACLU has gone too far, I don't agree with that, I'm not going to support them on that. And they, they, they can't stand the positions we take <coughs> until they are victimized by something themselves. Then they come fanatically, they become fanatic ACLU supporters and First Amendment supporters because free speech rights finally have collided with their own interests. <coughs> there is a great book written by a guy in New York City that I read some years ago called um, Free Speech for Me But Not for Thee. Nat Hentoff wrote that book. He's a writer in New York, or he was anyway at the time. And uh, he sums up that most, most people realize that free speech is something that I can support if I'm talking about my own free speech rights, but not your free speech rights. And I want to echo something that Steve Brown mentioned, which is the indivisibility of free speech rights. That if, if I want to have any rights that, that are respected, I have to grant them to everyone else, including things that I don't like. Free speech protects people that we do not like. This free speech is for speech that we hate, in fact. <coughs> I mean, we haven't had too many cases where Beethoven needs speech, free speech rights. <coughs> We've had lots of cases where other less popular musical groups in recent years need free speech rights. Maybe someday Beethoven will need them too, I don't know. You never know what's going to happen in this country. <coughs> But free speech rights are important because, I, 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 again, I need to protect what I hate. I want to tell you a story about when I first joined the ACLU, which is after a case that came along in the 1970s, I think it was. And it was involved the American Nazi Party seeking a parade permit in a suburb outside of Chicago, Illinois. I think it was Cicero, Illinois. The, the, the way they wanted to have their parade was through a Jewish neighborhood that was largely inhabited by people who survived the Holocaust. Talk about provocation, right? They wanted to have a parade, and the, the local town council denied them the permit to have a parade, thinking this is going to be unpopular, we're going to go with this, we're going to say no to this group. Well, guess who took that case? The ACLU. A lawyer whose parents had been 
Holocaust survivors, I think, if I remember correctly, at least his relatives had been Holocaust survivors, took the case and won the case. The client, the American Nazi Party, didn't know at the time that they had a Jewish lawyer. They later on fired the lawyer after he won the case. But it was too late, he'd won the case. The, I read about what happened in that case afterwards, and this is what caused me to join the ACLU. Because this is the greatest lesson, I think, about the free speech rights. The parade went forward again. The permit was granted reluctantly by the town. The parade went forward. And about 20 American Nazis marched through the streets of this Jewish community. About 2,000 people lined the streets. And they turned their back as the marches came by. There was no greater message, no greater communication than, than that act. And I thought that the ACLU was correct in doing what it did. And that inspired the ACLU lost a lot of members because of that case, because of taking the American Nazi Party as a client. But that was what caused me to join the ACLU. And I, ever since then, I've thought that's, that was correct and still is correct. Still the correct decision to make. Now, there are some limits on um, the free speech rights. And one of them is, is called the fighting words exception. There's, you, you may be wondering, are there, is there no limit to what can be said or done under the, under the First Amendment rights? No matter how provocative you are. And as, as I've been hinted at already, there are some limits. One is called fighting words. If, if the government or somebody else can show that what you're doing is going to imminently cause, and the key is imminent, cause violence or reaction, then maybe you don't have free speech rights. And obviously that opens up a very subjective exception because it's, it's too easy for the courts to say, well, something's dangerous imminent, right? If, if I advocate against a war that's being waged by the United States, does that mean that I'm in, in imminent danger to the war effort? It shouldn't, but it has been held that people have gone to jail because of that issue. But there, there are, obviously there are a lot of gray areas that can't be defined anywhere in any written document, even in the Constitution, even in the First Amendment. The exceptions to the First Amendment rights. Even for an absolutist belief in the First Amendment rights, there are exceptions to it. The last thing I want to mention is that the First Amendment is not a panacea for everything. It doesn't guarantee us that we'll find a way out of the problems that we're in right now. But it is a good method of doing something about problems. And it's one of the things that gives me encouragement lately is there's never been a time, even in the 1960s, there's never been a time in my lifetime that I've seen more good people doing good things in this country than, than is happening right now. I, I feel very strongly about that issue. There's a lot of people who are very doomsday about what's going on in this country right now. And it's true, there are some very, very scary things. There are some horrible things going on right now, especially for someone like myself who's grown up in the Civil Rights era, in the anti-Vietnam era. Horrible things going on. Racist things. All sorts of horrible, negative things going on. At the same time, there's never been so many good people doing good things. And I take heart in that, and I want to believe that there's a brighter tomorrow because of that issue. But there's no bright tomorrow that we're going to reach where we can rest on our laurels and say, fine, that, that issue is over and done with, we've won. Because that never happens, unfortunately. Thank you very much.
we say to America is be true to what you said on paper. If I lived in China or even Russia or any totalitarian country, maybe I could understand some of these illegal injunctions. Maybe I could understand the denial of certain basic First Amendment privileges because they haven't committed themselves to that over there. But somewhere I read of the freedom of assembly. Somewhere I read of the freedom of speech. Somewhere I read of the freedom of press. Somewhere I read that the greatness of America is the right to protest far right. allowed for this space to happen. I think it's a, as someone mentioned, it's a somber anniversary as we remember Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., as we honor his life and legacy, and we really center our conversation on the foundation in which he provided for us to be able to have the privileges and the rights that we have today. I stand here today because of individuals like Dr. King. And I don't take that for granted. And so I'm excited to spend some time with all of you and uh, engage in such an important conversation around activism and the work that we need to be doing on college campuses and in our broader community as well. And so um, I want you to bear with me. I'm fighting allergies, a cold, and living in a home with two five-year-old twins that are always sick. <laughs> so just, just bear with me on that end. But um, I wanted to start our, our conversation, our time together, um, for my segment, focusing on Dr. King, because that's why we're here, is to focus on freedom of speech and, and, and really center it on what, what he provided us in his, during his day and time. And I want you to, to recognize that, you know, Dr. King was young. Dr. King was 39 when his voice was silenced because of hate, 50 years ago today. Dr. King was in his mid-20s when he started the Montgomery bus boycott. Mid-20s. For many of us in this room, that's our age. Or well, that's not far from it. And so the power of young people to be able to create change and to have a voice is very real. And we're seeing it today from Black Lives Matter, 
to the students at Parkland School in Florida, the ability to use our voice as young people to enact change. And so we look at this image of the 1960s, the height of the Civil Rights Movement, and we think about how Dr. King used his voice. We think about how he fought for freedom. In his, in his last speech on April 3rd, 1968, he talked about, I may not get there with you, but I've seen that mountaintop. And as activists, we may not get to where we want to see true equality, but we will know that we will leave this earth doing what's right for those who matter. And that's the important piece of activism, is knowing that you may not see that change in your lifetime, but you will leave this earth better than how you found it. And that's what Dr. King did. And that's how we can carry on his legacy as we move forward. So I want to frame our, our, our time together with this quote. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Because Dr. King was about fighting against all forms of injustice, not just racism. Dr. King spent a lot of time fighting for the rights of the poor, fighting for economic justice. His final speech was in Memphis, Tennessee, where he was speaking on behalf of the sanitation workers who were on strike in Memphis so that they could have equitable rights as employees. So when you think about activism, you have to really focus in on all forms of injustice, not just injustices that matter to you, right? We all have certain things that matter to us, whether it's our gender, our race, our sexual orientation, our class, but we really need to focus in on all forms of injustice if we're gonna do this work right. So I wanna spend our time together focusing on this title of living in moments of chaos. I think we can all agree that we are living in moments of chaos. In this country, in our society, we turn on the news, we scroll through our Facebook feed, what do we see? Chaos. And so how do we navigate activism? How do we navigate resiliency? But most importantly, how do we navigate self-care in these moments of chaos? And so what are your hopes? What are your hopes for tomorrow? Think about that. What do you hope for as a student at Rhode Island College to make this place better, to make this place more inclusive? Right, because we talked about the diversity of this place, right? Which is great. It's never been as diverse as it is before. But is it inclusive where every student matters? Every student feels as if they matter. So what is your hopes for a better tomorrow here at Rhode Island College and within our broader society? Because a better world is possible. A better world is possible. We just have to be committed to doing the work. We have to be committed to doing the work. And so as you think about your role as, in, in, as being a voice for change, I want you to think about this question and turn to your neighbor just for literally one to two minutes, if that. And answer the question, what drives you to be an activist and a voice for social change? Why are you here today? Why did you decide to come into this space to talk about this particular topic? Right? So what drives you to be an activist and a voice for social change? Just talk to your neighbor for literally 30 seconds to a minute. I know it's not a lot of time, but we don't have a lot of time to be really confident. <laughs> to continue the conversation beyond this quick moment. But in the interest of time, I want to make sure we can able to move forward. So what, what sparks your passion 
to being a, an activist for change, right? A voice for change. For me, it's my father. My father was born into poverty in the deep south of Montgomery, Alabama in the 1950s. He was born in the height of the Civil Rights Movement. He marched with Dr. King. When Dr. King marched from Selma to Montgomery. My father was in Montgomery waiting for his arrival. He was a teenager, young kid. And it is through his story of being born into poverty, living in segregation, and being able to get out the confines of that hate and economic inequities to provide a better life for what would be for my sister and me and my mom, who we ultimately married. That I am more inspired each and every day. So think about who inspires you to be an activist for change. For me, it's my dad. And I think about the fact that I am one generation removed from segregation. One generation removed from segregation. That's not that long. And then with, you think about the historical context and what that provides, and yet today, in 2018, we're still fighting for a lot of that same justice and equality, where individuals are fighting for their lives to even matter. Individuals being killed, being victimized, witnessing hate because of the color of their skin, because of the people they choose to love, because of how they show up in this world. And so identify someone in your head, right? Or it may be you, who has experienced pain, violence, or hurt as a result of a form of injustice. Identify who that person is for you. And let, it, let that sink in. And ask yourself, did you speak up for that person? Did you speak out for the injustice that they were experiencing? Because what's going to happen is, if they come for that person, or if they come for you, are there going to be people there to support you? And oftentimes there isn't. And that's the role of an activist, to be able to speak up and speak out against black lives, against trans lives, against the LGBT community, against immigrants, against disabled people, against Muslims. These are the spaces in which we have the power to invoke change. But what it takes for you to invoke that change is courage. It takes us courage to be able to release the fears that we have to speak out for some of those communities. Some of us have fear towards not wanting to speak out towards some of those communities. Right? How will we be judged? How will we be seen? But it is our ability to be courageous in those moments, knowing that the groups that we need to speak out for matter. Knowing that Muslim lives matter. Knowing that trans lives matter. Trans women of color are being killed at a higher rate than any community in this country. But what are we doing to make sure that those communities feel as if they matter? What are we doing to rewrite that narrative? What are we doing to support black lives so that black men can walk freely in this country just like their white male car counterparts? They're not killed because they're holding a cell phone. Or carrying some Skittles just because of the color of their skin. What are we doing to support our immigrant population, our DACA students? These injustices affect our campuses. Our students are, these, are part of these social identities. What are we doing to support them as activists? And we, just, we need to recognize that we cannot be a campus that tolerates any form of hate. Any form of hate. So if we're seeing hate on our campus, we need to speak up, just like these communities are doing across the country. We have the power to do so. Dr. Angela Davis once said, I am no longer accepting the things I cannot change. I'm changing the things I cannot accept. 
I'm changing the things I cannot accept. That needs to be your charge. We must engage in social responsibility because we have an obligation. We have an obligation to act, to advocate, and foster equity for everyone, creating socially just communities. I want us to think about how we move from just being civil with one another to actually actively engaging in social responsibility. I want us to think about how we move from inclusion to creating a true sense of belonging for the people that matter. I want us to move from just respecting people to fully accepting people for who they are. For who they are. I don't want to just tolerate you, right, for your identity, but I want to bring you into my space and embrace you and empower you because of who you are and how you show up in this world. Because how you show up in this world matters. And so we think about a lot of buzzwords, with, whether it's inclusion, social justice, inclusive access. I just wanted to quickly define that for you. Because as an activist, you need to be able to know how those are named. Inclusion is where all people are recognized and celebrated and have this sense of belonging. Whereas social justice is this space of equity, is reaching a point of opportunity for everyone, where the opportunity is accessible for everyone. Right? So social justice takes inclusion to the next level. And then what you ultimately want to be able to achieve is inclusive excellence, where that really integrates the idea of inclusion and social justice and it becomes a shared responsibility for everyone that's part of the community to infuse a practice of inclusion, of social justice, a space in which everyone is celebrated, and those values are fundamental through your mission, through your values, through your principles, and your guiding core values of the institution that you're a part of or the community that you're a part of. And so when you think about activism, when you think about self-care, there are some barriers that are put in place. First, it's this whole idea of racial battle fatigue, right? Being able to fight and fight and fight, and the feeling of being exhausted, right? And feeling as if you, 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 you just can't do no more. There's also the racial microaggressions. How many people can relate to some of these things, right? Some of the things that you might experience on your campus, some of the things you might experience in your community of experiencing racial microaggressions. The big thing around activism and being able to navigate all of this work is the psychological trauma that it may provide, right? The ability to actually have to then sit in the moment with all of the stuff that's happening and being able to process it and maintain a form of wellness for yourself. So we need to be aware of that. We also need to be aware of the lack of validation from others. We don't always get the validation that we're looking for. And so it doesn't inspire us to want to continue to move on in this work. The old piece of navigating intersectionality is important, right? Being able to think about the different marginalized identities that show up in an individual's lived experiences. That's critical. And then when you're doing activism work and you don't see representation, and, the, and you see no representation, the impact of being the only one. Right? The sense of being the only one can be a very isolating and traumatizing experience for people. So that's why we need to collectively come together and join forces across all different groups and backgrounds so that everybody feels a sense of value in this work. And so we want to be able to navigate all of this activism work and being mindful of self-care. And that's how I'm going to wrap my, my final thoughts up, is just sharing some thoughts around self-care. Self-care is critical. Self-care is needed. Right? You need to be able to think about how you would do that. And so here's some collective practices that you can take with you around self-care. First, heal often and engage in healthy activities that allow you to recenter the importance of self-care in your everyday life. Think about what those are for you. Be critical about what spaces you occupy. I've been working through my own experiences of trying to eliminate toxic people, toxic relationships. Right? Think about the spaces you occupy that so you can put yourself in spaces with like-minded people that allow you to be your authentic self. Be intentional about how often you engage and how you engage in social media, because it can be too much sometimes. Sometimes you need that break, and it's okay. 
Develop partnerships with others who also actively show up and resist injustice and demonstrate in meaningful ways. Those partnerships can be important in terms of how you guys lean on each other. And identify a social justice network in your community, right? You're in the, you're in the Providence area, right? Providence is, is a diverse city, and I know there's social justice networks not only on this campus, but within the broader community. Think about how you can engage in that. And it's okay to say no, step away, and take a break. As activists, you gotta know when to step in and step out, right? Be able to do that effectively. And specify ways in which you can hold yourself and your peers accountable so that you are pushing forward and you are creating change over time. Understand that change takes time. Being in community is important. And together, we will uplift one another and our communities for a better tomorrow. But what do you also need in self-care? Is the ability to have allies with you along the way. Allies with you along the way. So as allies in this room, whether you're an ally for, against race, racial injustice, gender injustice, inequities, right, or any other form of injustice, you need to be able to lean into discomfort and become comfortable with the uncomfortable. Speak up and speak out, but don't speak over. Allies, it's important to understand your role in not taking up too much space and listening sometimes to what needs to be said by those that are marginalized. Listen and validate the stories of those who experience oppression. Be reflective and mindful of the history of marginalized groups. Marginalized folks, folks of color, folks in the LGBT community, and others have endured a lot, have had to overcome a lot, and our history is important. And so we have to acknowledge that and take that into consideration. <coughs> Name inequities that you see in your spaces. Acknowledge and unlearn your own biases. That is very critical to the work of doing activism work and being an ally in this work. Being a bystander is not enough. You just can't stand on the sidelines. You can't turn this stuff on like a light switch. You have to be in it, right? <coughs> you have to be in it. Take the initiative to educate yourself. Don't look to the marginalized communities to educate you. You gotta do your own homework. And be socially responsible to hold yourself accountable. Never accept the injustice. Change your behavior, change your actions. And so the journey continues, my friends. Our campuses need student voices where we can act, enact some change for our campus communities. You are the voices that we need. The time is now for you to speak up and speak out. And when you think about self-care, I love this quote by Brianna West. True self-care is making the choice to build a life you don't need to regularly escape from. Let me repeat that. True self-care is making the choice to build a life you don't need to regularly escape from. We are living in a time that many of us want to be able to just walk away from, because it's too oppressive, it's too burdensome, it's filled with so much hate. But if we do activism work right, we will build a life in which we want to see. And so think about what you're going to stop doing as an activist. Maybe you want to reframe how you do certain things. Think about what you're going to start doing. You're going to do something better to make this world a better place. And what you're going to continue doing, because what you do now is already effective, but you want to enhance it. And the answer to injustice is not to silence the critic, but to end the injustice. It's a quote by Paul Robeson, who the cultural center I work for is named after. If you don't know the work of Paul Robeson, look him up after you leave here today. Because if it wasn't for Paul Robeson, there would be no Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. So as we, as we uh, conclude this portion and move into a Q&A piece, I want us to commit to a pledge, to a pledge in which we can collectively move our communities forward to a better space, to a better world, because a better world is possible. Because we have to persevere. And we have to live out <coughs> Dr. King's ideas and values. So don't just remember Dr. King today. 
Remember Dr. King tomorrow, 50 years from now, and what he did for us to be able to do the work that we do today. So join with me in this pledge, and then we'll move into q and Whenever I see poverty, repeat after me. Whenever I see poverty. Whenever, whenever I see, I see poverty. poverty. Whenever I see injustice. Wherever I see injustice. Wherever I see the wealthy. Wherever I see the wealthy. And powerful. And powerful. Seek the advantage. Seek the advantage. At the expense of the vulnerable. At the expense of the vulnerable. I will step forward. I will step forward. And take action. And take action. In defense of those, in defense of those who find their voices silenced, who find their voices silenced, and opportunity stunted, and opportunity stunted, I will do so. I will do so. Whether my actions, whether my actions make me part of a powerful movement, make me part of a powerful movement, or whether I stand alone, or whether I stand alone. So let's go forth and let's do this work collectively or alone, while taking care of ourselves in this process, recognizing that the work that we do will make a better tomorrow today. Thank you. Thank you. Based on instances and situations that have happened some 